Terrace, regular meeting of May 9th, 2017. Our invocation tonight will be given by Pastor Stephen Brandt from the Church on the Hill. And immediately following that, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance led by Don Larkin from the Veterans Wall of Freedom Committee. If you'd please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening. Let us bow our heads as we look to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this beautiful evening to once again ask for your blessings to be with us. I ask that you would bless our mayor and those who serve with her on her council. I ask that you would grant them wisdom as they serve the city and the people of Grand Terrace. We are a small community with big dreams, and we look to you this evening for your guidance, your provision, and the blessings on our work together. Be with each of us here this evening as this council meets. May the discussion and the decisions that are made here tonight be honoring to you. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Brandt. Thank you, Mr. Larkin. Madam City Clerk, may we have roll call, please? Council Member Reinars. Present. Council Member Hussey. Present. Council Member Wilson. I am here. Mayor Pro Tem Lodless. Present. Mayor McNabell. Present. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Our first item tonight is special presentations, of which we have two. First one will be a presentation of the Every, Every 15 Minutes program by Deputy Frank Navarro. Good evening, Mayor, Council, members of the public. I'm Lieutenant Doug Wolf. I'm with the San Mateo County Sheriff's Department, and one of my responsibilities is patrol, overseeing patrol operations for the city of Grand Terrace. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to present this prestigious Commander's Award to Deputy Frank Navarro for his efforts for the Every 15-Minute Program. <clears throat> this, uh, this was a two-day event. Uh, which challenged students to think about drinking and driving. This event brought together a broad coalition of local partnerships, which is the City of Grand Terrace, CHP, Loma Linda Hospital, County Fire, uh, Colton Fire, and many local businesses. Frank, come on up here. He did not do this alone. He had lots of uh, help, uh, and uh, he was uh, in charge of a uh, planning committee, which they met monthly. Uh, and then as they got closer on to game day, they, they met more often. Um, but it was a, it was a uh, planning committee of about eight people, and Frank was a driving force of this committee. If you attended one or even both days of this event, you got a glimpse of the effort that was put forth to make this thing successful. Again, this was eight months of planning, and again, Frank was a driving force behind it. So I just, Frank from uh, the Sheriff's Department, as well as Central Station and the City of Grand Terrace. We really do appreciate the hard work, and you definitely earned the Commander's Award. Thank you. Yeah. Photo real quick before he splits, or? Okay, I thought he had a presentation, but. No, th no that was the presentation. Okay, well, then I will say before we have the photo up, how very pleased I am that we were part of this uh, presentation to you. And thank you so much for your hard work on this program. I've heard nothing but, I want to say wonderful things about it, but truly it, it is something that those that participated and even the parents of the students that participated found it very meaningful. And it, it, it's, it's something that I'm very happy to know that we continue to do in our schools. And I would, uh, like my colleagues to have a comment, an opportunity to comment as well. We'll start with Councilmember Hussey. Frank, outstanding job. 
you know, you and all your workers that do that. We have uh, actually family friends who participate in the Mesa is really, you know, an eye-opener, and I hit them hard. Um, but if we could just save one student from this, uh, you know, that's worth the effort. But, you know, I know it's it's a good event, and I'm glad that the city can help out with that, and I'm glad that, and I'm happy that all you guys, you know, and I just want to say thank you for everything that you've done for that and keeping this event going and, and making it realistic so it'll hit home and hit the students so they can see what's going on and save their lives. So thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you. Every Each year we um, encounter folks that uh, participated, and it's a quite sobering and, and very emotional event, and it's very necessary, and I want to thank you for your efforts on our behalf and the children uh, that attend our schools. Thank you. Council Member Wilson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I really appreciate the uh, effort. Uh, in, in my day, it was the uh, Blood on the Asphalt Road uh, uh, movie that we used to watch. And it made an impression, but not necessarily a positive impression. And this, very definitely, is something that doesn't go away from the students' minds. Uh, it, really, uh, it really stays with them because they graphically see it. And I hear it all the time, really. It's a terrific program, and I uh, wish you wish you well in all your endeavors. Thank you. Councilmember Reinhardt. I'd like to echo my colleagues' congratulations as well. And having worked DUI cases for years, I saw daily the devastation that's left behind by everybody who's involved in these types of cases. So any sort of additional awareness that can be brought forth is greatly appreciated. Thank you. And lastly, Deputy Navarro. Although this is a, a program of high impact, I know also that you have a role with our students in the schools the rest of the days of the year that help them to understand that sheriff deputies are here to help them to work through their issues and they're not somebody to be feared. So thank you for your efforts every other day of the week in addition to the time and effort that you put into this particular program. And we would like to have a picture with you. Our second presentation for tonight is a MIDAS program update. And to give us some words on that, City Manager Harold Duffy. Thank you, Mayor. For the record, G. Harold Duffy, the City Manager. Um, this is actually a really exciting time in the City of Grand Terrace since we just recently made a transaction with the Lewis Group regarding the purchase of uh, 40 acres, roughly 50 acres of land that the city has owned for a while. Uh, just, I'll just do a very quick presentation. The city entered an EMA with the Lewis Group in January 13th, 2015. Then it came back and approved a DDA, where an EMA is the Exclusive Negotiations Agreement. A DDA is the Disposition of the Development Agreement, basically identifying things that would happen with the property. So the city approved that. DDA with the Lewis Group on December 13, 2016. Uh, the Lewis Group closed on the property with the city uh, on May 1, 2017. The city um, sold the property to the Lewis Group uh, for about $800,000. Part of that DDA required the Lewis Group to spend over the next year or so about a million dollars to address uh, a specific plan, environmental impact report, and a master development plan. One of the significant things about the project 
is. Although the Lewis Group purchased this 40, 50 acres of land here, the specific plan requires them to do a specific plan for the entire area. And so what that really means is that the land use areas will be decided, there will be proposals in terms of what the particular types of businesses and uh, developments going to occur in the particular area. So as the Lewis Group completes their project, they will also work with the private property owners for this. So the Lewis Group is expected to invest about $100 million in this particular area. And then another $100 million will be developed through private, uh, private landowners uh, for commercial and other in endeavors in a particular area. So just very quickly, um, I think I went over that one already. This is an aerial view of some of the land area. Um, this is actually going to be near Commerce Way, so the area, a particular area. So one of the other important aspects as, as Lewis moves forward with the project is that the specific plan will address issues like circulation, storm drains, and, and park-related issues. But not only for the project, but the benefits will also occur for the entire community in terms of helping with circulation and trying to address larger storm drain issues within the city and also um, with our parks and recreations and community leagues. Uh, and my final slide, and I hope that I don't have the same faith as Marie Antoinette when I say, let's let them eat cake. And so we're going to actually take a moment to celebrate our specific plan, and we're going to give a photo op with the Lewis group is here. Uh, Randall Lewis and some of his associates are here with us tonight to help celebrate this really great milestone in our economic development for the city of Grand Terrace. Well, with that, I say we are in recess for 10 minutes for cake. All right. So if the council will... Uh, yeah.
resume our meeting at this time. Thank you for being here to help us celebrate, and I appreciate staff putting together the decorations and the cake and the, and the whole presentation. That was very nice. We'll move on to the next item, which is our consent calendar. Our consent calendar items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by one. At, they'll be acted upon at one time by the city council without discussion. Any council member, staff member, or citizen may remove an item of, from the consent calendar for discussion. At this time, are there any requests for removal of an item? Council members, anything that you'd like to remove? Okay, I would like to remove item six. So I will look for a motion on the balance. Motion for approval there. Please vote. The motion passes unanimously with Council Member Reinars, Wilson, Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro, Mayor Pro Tem Robles voting yes, and Mayor McNabo voting yes. Okay, thank you. Item six is the execution of a reimbursement agreement with Aegis Pacific. Aegis Pico, sorry, housing LP for Pico Street paving, and this was a this was a project that was set to be entered into by the city and this particular company to repave a, a, a repave the whole portion of Pico Street, as it was the. The company was set, the developer was set to pave half of the street, and the city was going to enter into an agreement with them so that the whole street could be paved, and it was paved without notification. A notification or execution of an agreement right. for a reimbursement. Okay. Now, I believe in paying somebody for work that they've done, and I understand that the core samples came back and they were acceptable. Hmm. But what I want to make sure is that this type of procedure doesn't happen in the future. And, and I know, Mr. French, you were not here when this happened. But I'm a little surprised that one of our main thoroughfares was closed down for repaving and our city staff did not know about it, especially when there were discussions with the developer in order to pave this street. Sure, I understand, Mayor. Are, are you taking measures so that this doesn't happen in the future? Uh, uh, yes, we are. Uh, however, in, in this case, uh, the developer had permission to work on his project within his project boundary, mm -hmm. which didn't include Pico. Okay. Uh, and though no, we were negotiating with him to do the whole Pico widening or repaving, grind and overlay. So at that time, uh, from my understanding, is uh, the on-site was ready, and he opted to pave all at one time. Uh, and that's what, including Pico, which which caused the problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in a typical course of action, you know, the work is prepared, and then uh, staff is called to come and inspect prior to the construction. Uh, in this case, the on-site was ready, and so I'm pretty sure that was cleared to go. But he included the off-site as well, which was the problem. Mm -hmm. So for the future, um, we will be uh, monitoring with the inspectors the projects closer, and uh, we will have the public works inspector coordinating with the on-site building inspector to be watching the project, not, you know, um, not um, twice as much, but more than normal. An effective amount. Yes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Whatever that may be. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I know I pulled this item off. Is there anybody that would like to speak? Council Member Wilson. I remember a, a, a brief conversation, and the city manager can probably respond to this. Uh, we talked about this particular issue, and I'd asked the question whether or not there were some road fees that could be reimbursed rather than straight cash. Whatever took place with that? Yes, sir. And uh, what we've done is I believe that <clears throat> We have, we are using our uh, maintenance of effort 
uh, fund is what we're using, which is money that we have to spend to acquire our Measure I funds. So we're applying that money for this project, which will go toward uh, using our Measure I funds is, is what we're doing. So, so in a sense, it's, it's cleaner for us to use our maintenance effort general fund component versus using the gas, the gas tax measure because of, because the project wasn't properly bid out in, in, the, in the process. And so um, that's where we are. And I, I just also wanted to add, too, is that uh, as the city attorney has reminded our staff is, and we also shared this with uh, the contractor, is that uh, because they did the work without the proper authorization, that the city is not required to reimburse them for the, for the work that was done. It was only after we got direction from the council to get the, the core samples to ensure the work was done properly. And because the developer has invested uh, in multiple projects, that, that we brought this item back to the council for reimbursement. But we've also had a very clear understanding and conversation with the developer that this should be an isolated incident and it shouldn't happen again. Any further comments? Yeah. Councilmember Wilson. Just one further question. Actually, this is for uh, Mr. Moore, I think. I didn't fill out a slip, but I can. Mr. Moore, your, your interior controls, who actually writes and signs the agreement on something like this to get the work done, or was this an extra? This was, this was an extra, and it, wow. and to, just to reconstruct what was happening at the time, just a little walk down memory lane. That was where we were having all the rain. We were having horrific problems down there. We, we had a bunch of coal patches in. They kept coming out. All the neighbors were complaining, uh, and we did this on a Saturday. All of a sudden, the rain went away. We had a little opening, and just boom, we did it. And uh, and I know it wasn't really the right thing to do in one sense, but in another sense, it sort of was because we. We just couldn't get in. We were we were, we meant to, to pave sooner, but we never uh, we never had an opening in the rain. And then when it happened, there's no way to get a hold of anybody. There's no way we can call anybody in the city and say, "Hey, can you get out here real quick and look at this?" I don't know how to do that. I don't think anybody knows how to do that. Well, I do have a question. If no. it was scheduled for a Saturday to as kind of an emergency measure. Uh, did we end up paying more money? No, no absolutely no not. Okay. And we put no market on it. We, yeah. we did not make a dime on it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Hussey. Yeah, a comment. Yeah, I agree with you, Mayor, about, you know, we, the city paying is just debts, but I also have agreement, you know, uh, well, about that, you know, they do something. I think it was a, what do you say, um, good initiative, bad judgment, you know, getting us there. You know, even though Mr. Moore has multiple contracts here, I want to treat each developer the same here, um, where that means you don't jump the gun, you don't cut corners, you don't do any of that stuff. And if they do, you know, I personally should be fine. Um, I don't want to see this happen again, and it's not fair for the other developers. And then we're setting a precedent. It's like, okay, well, I, you get a slap on the hand the first time. No, this is a one-shot deal. That's it. Next time, you know, no payment due. My Thing is, no payment due and a hefty fine to make sure they don't do this because we have the city staff. If it can't be done on the time, then it waits till the next week. You know, it might be an inconvenience, but we have to make sure it's done right for public safety. So that was just my main concern on that thing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And so, Mr. French, it sounds like maybe our developers need to have a weekend phone number in case mm -hmm. they decide that they have an initiative that they want to see if they can move forward on it. And it's it's that balance between being business friendly and letting our developers get things done in a timely and effective manner but at the same time we do need to follow we do need to follow the procedures that have been set forth and so I don't have any more comments I appreciate your coming in Mr. Moore Thank and, you. and I know that this won't happen again no it shouldn't have happened at all but, but uh, once again we had yeah. unbelievable rain this year I think it's kind of dim in our memory now but at the time it was very intense okay all right okay. Thanks. And thank you for your clarification, Director French. And at this time, I'll go ahead and motion approval of this one since I pulled it off the consent. Is there a second? 
I'll second it. All right, let's vote. Motion passes with Council Member Reiners, Wilson, Hussey voting yes, Mayor Pro Tem Robles voting yes, Mayor McNamo voting yes. Thank you. Madam um, Mayor, may I recommend that you have the city clerk read the ordinance that was passed in the consent agenda, item number five? Certainly. Madam City Clerk, will you read that ordinance for us for item number five? An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace, California, to amend section 12.04.060, required when, and add chapter 12.10, revocable encroachment permit, to Title 12, streets, sidewalks, and public places of the Grand Terrace Municipal Code relating to parkway encroachments. Thank you. Now we'll move to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items not on the agenda for tonight. Because of restrictions contained in California law, the City Council may not discuss or act on any item not on the agenda, but may briefly respond to statements made or ask questions for clarification. An item also might have a brief re response from staff and it may be or requested to be agendized for, for future meeting. Is there anybody who would like to speak during this time? Thank you. <coughs> we have a request from Don Larkin for the Veterans Wall of Freedom. Don Larkin, Veterans Wall of Freedom. Madam Mayor, members of the council, and members of the public. On behalf of the Veterans Wall of Freedom and the uh, Foundation of Grand Terrace, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to our Memorial Day ceremony that will be on Memorial Day, Monday, May 29th at 11 a.m. at Veterans Freedom Park, formerly known as Pico Park. This is a time for us to remember those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we enjoy today. I'm also glad to announce that our keynote speaker would be Robert Ewing, some of you might know him as Master Ewing, who is a retired major from the United States Army. As you're aware, we dedicated the Veterans Wall of Freedom last Veterans Day, November 11, 2016. This was reaching a major objective, but we're not finished yet. So far, we've raised about a quarter million dollars, either in direct donations or in-kind contributions. But we still need to raise about $22,000 for the final items, such as the informational columns and a few other elements. Most of these can be finished through the plaque reservations. There's over 1,600 plaques that are available at the Veterans Law of Freedom. But right now, there's about 800 of them that have already been reserved through our sponsors and through individuals. So it's really a good time for anyone who really wants to honor their veteran to make that reservation. This provides a permanent mon honor to your veteran. It also helps complete the Veterans Wall of Freedom. And on the practical sense, since we're a nonprofit organization, it is tax deductible. One of the things that we're also going to be completing is time capsules that we're going to actually at the site. So one of the things we're asking is that if you're making a plaque reservation, this is a great time for you to bring a memento to be from that veteran to be placed in that time capsule. This could be something we always say about the size of a deck of cards, like a photo, a medal, a coin, or a patch. But it's really a good thing that's going to be permanently interned there, so maybe years to come that people will see this. So on Memorial Day, it would be a good opportunity for individuals to reserve a plaque to honor their veteran. And they could bring a memento for the veteran for the time capsule. But most importantly, it's a time for us to honor those who gave lives their lives for our freedom. If you need any additional information, feel free to visit our website at veteranswalloffreedom.org. Thank you very much, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Larkin. Thank you. <coughs> our next speaker is Suzanne Cent Centoya.
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Santaya. Just a point of clarification. We didn't vote a year ago to take any of your land. That was a condition of the city becoming a city in incorporating it. And there are certain rights of way that, that are put in place when cities incorporate. But I think Mr. Duffy has an update for you on, on your particular situation. Yes, ma'am. Um, Based on the, the input that the council received, the council actually uh, did uh, move forward with an ordinance. And tonight they actually had the second reading of that ordinance. So there was going to be a process for you to actually do the encroachment permit through the normal process. And you'll be able to, to uh, after examination, you'll be able to attain that wall on the, on the line that you want next, next to the sidewalk if you meet the, the, the conditions. And I believe that the way the ordinance is written, you should be able to meet those conditions. So the next phase in this is, uh, I believe, in the next meeting, the uh, Public Works Director will be back with the council for a, fee, for a fee ordinance. The ordinance will be established. There will be a fee associated. And then shortly after that, you'll be able to, to apply for that, for that program. So I would imagine uh, by June the 1st, you should be able to come and apply for the, for the permit. Yes. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Santoy. You're welcome to come back even if you get this resolved. I appreciate your time. Thank you for coming in. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak tonight? All right, no more see, speaker cards. See, seeing no takers, I will close public comment and bring it back to council for their communications. And we will start with Council Member Brian Reinars. I have nothing to report. All right. Thank you. Council Member Bill Hussey. Sorry. First of all, I want to I can, uh, thank you everybody for coming out here tonight and helping us celebrate. Really appreciate it. Um, attended the art show for a brief minute. I got called in for work, but it was really great seeing you know, the city staff that came out there in support too. And um, what a great group of talent people we have here doing that. And like I said, I can't even draw a straight stick man or something, but it was just beautiful. The art that they had there was just amazing. And also, um, I received my dog license renewal form in the mail today, and it should be in some of the other people are, uh, need to get their dog. Our pet uh, owners that need to uh, get their license, you know, I want to thank you for taking the responsibility for getting your pet license and 
also the shots. I believe we got a shot clinic coming up here May 18th. But um, the dog license renewals are coming up. And one other thing, I had a League of City meeting on, what was it, April 27th, and we talked about some uh, assembly bills, and then I talked to the city manager about uh, some of the things that you know, might concern the city. But I want to thank the mayor, because part of the League of City, she, the mayor, I don't know if I have to fill out a 700 form, Richard, for the guitar and the glasses for here, but... <laughs> um, the mayor probably heard me play a real guitar, so she bought me a fake guitar here. And then I got the Beetle glasses. I don't know. Get these on. I don't know how they look. All right? Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, the League of City would like to invite all the city council and their spouse to come out February 19th for the Lewis Family Playhouse in Rancho Cucamonga for it's a Beatles McCarthy year, so they're going to have, you know, meet the mayors and all the other uh, important people out here, and then we're going to have, uh, you know, you're going to listen to my, well, it's not going to be Paul McCartney, but it's going to be a guy that looks like him and sings like him, and I will not be getting up and singing because, you know, while I'm at church, they pass the thing around so I don't sing, so you guys don't want to hear me sing, but I could bring the guitar and try to, you know, strum up something, but thank you, Mary, for this, and like I said, all the council members and your spouses are invited. I'm pretty sure the only thing you have to do is fill out a 700 form for that, same from the League of Cities. But it's really easy paperwork. Um, but they want you guys there, and if you can make it, you know, let us know by May 15th. I'll send the information out again. I know we got the invitation, but I'll send it out again on our email. But it's going to be a fun time, and it was a great event last year, so it's really a great event. And, and the wives or the husbands seem to like it too. So, so that's all I have, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hussey. And that's so that you can play air guitar on oh, okay. that evening if you play. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Council Member Doug Wilson. That, the air guitar makes sense with an air, uh, with a pumped-up guitar. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, i just like to say uh, just one thing. Uh, I, I had made a meeting so, over the last two weeks, but um, I'd really like to thank and put on the record uh, great thanks to our city manager, uh, for coordinating the uh, Lewis uh, closing. Um, this is a, an incredible monument for the city of Grand Terrace. Uh, I know all of us kind of had a hand in it, but bottom line is is that this is one of the reasons why we were so appreciative of having Mr. Duffy come on board, and he's followed through as well as the Lewis's followed through, and that's a new thing for developers, and I've been working with them for 45 years, so I know. Um, and I, this is going to be, uh, I believe, uh, a great boon to the city, and uh, things are going to change around here a little bit with the uh, the advent of the uh, clover leaf there on uh, Barton Road. So, watch out for all kinds of fireworks. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Wilson, Mayor Pro Tem Sylvia Robles. Um, have a, a little bit more today because um, I attended um, this. Southern California Associated Governments annual um, conference. But before I get to that, because I have some notes on, on my phone, um, I serve on the uh, board of directors of Amatrans. And we, at the last meeting, approved a $98.6 million operating budget. It was a 3.2% increase. The service enhancements include providing bus service every 15 minutes to Ontario International Airport and by adding early morning and late evening service hours to the SBX line. And they're also going to um, launch in the beginning of the year a mobile fare payment op uh, option so you don't have to fumble with machines and all that when you're um, making your, your way through the, the area. They're also... Um, I'm sure Amatran sends all of you the, the newsletter, which the highlights um, items. Um, SBX, by the way, is increasing its ridership, which is excellent. Um, general bus uh, ridership throughout the region is, is declining, and apparently um, when the price of gas and the economy is doing a little bit better, people tend not to use public transportation, they'll drive. So we're all pretty interested to see once uh, we see the gas tax implemented or what volatility we have in the economy, how that will be affected. Um, the other um, 
we met, the Southern California SCAG we met, and the um, discussion was about the the future, and it was painting for us a picture on the horizon of big data, driverless vehicles, um, and continuing to expand mobility um, through public transportation, also addressing the issue of the first mile and the last mile, because generally, say for example, if I wanted to commute to LA, well, I gotta figure out how to get to the Metrolink and leave a vehicle. Then you get to Union Station, you gotta figure out, well, how am I gonna get reliably to your next link? So that's the things they are trying to solve. Um, Councilman Frank Navarro and I uh, stepped outside and took advantage of uh, being a passenger on a driverless shuttle. And apparently this shuttle already has contracts to provide that first and last mile. So we just went around this little circle, so and there was a guy in it that seemed to know what he was doing, so it wasn't scary. And But, you know, it um, made the remark to um, some folks from the Akaipa that uh, I was talking to a girlfriend of mine, and we're a little bit older, and we're talking about how our grandmothers, there were no phones, there were no vehicles. You know, TVs didn't come out until the late 40s. So it was kind of fascinating to be in this era now in a cusp of another another new age of innovation and, and a big change in, in how we live and do things. It was pretty exciting. Um, the, the keynote speaker talked about data and how now you can get data from government and manipulate it and draw a picture of things. And he did some pretty neat examples. Uh, one of those, there was always um, this one area of the city where people were getting ticketed. But there was no fire hydrant there. There was no no parking signs. So the, the dilemma was, well, why were um, a high propensity of tickets there? So it was just like a curb cut. And it was intended uh, to be um, for pedestrians to start making their way into the street. But it was never painted appropriately. So the police thought anybody that parked there, they were in violation. And so it was a, a, a big revenue source. That, and so they point out that, and he says, that's it, kind of, kind of the, the, you just see these peculiar things that you want to question. The other thing was, for example, hospitals and emergencies and where do they peak and ebb and flow and that, that kind of thing. And um, so they're just saying that with data you can um, uh, manipulate it and you can, can kind of come up with some policy solutions or governance solutions. And that the, the difficulty has been getting government to trust providing that information. Um, and now we're getting more to an open source of uh, data. Even for, um, uh, in the last session, um, Jack Dangerman for SRI in Redlands talked about, he was in New York looking over the sho shoulder of an employee and he goes, what are you doing? He goes, I'm updating the water lines. He goes, we're almost in real time, you know, as people are putting, uh, updating their maps, I'm updating our maps. And it's talked about, you know, you go in the roads and he says, one of the utilities is gonna come and, and make a mistake. So if they have this information, it, it, it eliminates all that. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, again, they, they, they talked about the housing uh, crunch and it was interesting to me because I don't practice real estate, but I have a license and I always look to see what's happening in the market. And what's fascinating to me, if you look at Inland Empire pricing and try to go west, something that that 450000 price point, you're getting something pretty shabby out, out there. And so when I wondered about all these condos that were being built in the 450 range that were kind of nice, and it turns out the panels there, that was all affordable housing through different partnerships that were being done. And they stopped saying that we've got to stop saying um, affordable housing because it's really not affordable. It's providing um, more product out there for people so it was uh, um, interesting, and they gave us a book of all the demographics for Grand Terrace, and I think they, they will send one to everybody. 
and I haven't had a chance to look at it. And I also attended the art show. I got to make a commitment to put some photographs that I've taken and try to do something with them. But I was, it's also, it was very impressive and we do have a lot of talent and it's very nice to see. I want to thank the committee for putting that together and thank you for the amount of time I took today. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. On April 28th and 29th, I attended the California Joint Powers Insurance Authority Executive Committee workshop. It's an annual workshop that, that this committee puts together to look to the future, sort of a, a planning couple of days. It was also their monthly meeting. This is the way that we insure our city is through this Joint Powers Insurance Authority. It was interesting to have a discussion with a futurist. She led us through some exercises to look at the future Focus, uh, focusing on trends and events that are likely or projected to happen in the future that could impact greatly this particular organization and the ability to cover catastrophes that would happen or, or maybe just have to adjust the way that they provide coverage for their members. We also had our monthly budget review, our claims review and the review of other items. It'll be interesting to see going forward how we put some of these future focused trends into play for the member agencies in a positive way. Things that we can, we as cities can take advantage of in changing the way that we operate to maybe minimize our exposure to risk and possibly even the cost of our coverage. On May 3rd, I w attended the San Bernardino I still want to call it sandbag. San Bernardino um, SBCTA. <laughs> SBCTA. It's the uh, the transit authority for the county and also the council of governments. So this was our, our monthly board meeting, and the items that I'm going to talk about were not reported on the general policy committee or the Metro Valley study session. But under transit, we had a consent calendar where we received the third quarter fiscal year 2016-17. Railroad right-of-way grants and use report. We also received an update on the West Valley Connector Project and gave direction to staff. Under Transportation Programming and Fund Administration, we awarded a FTA funds award to the project in West Valley. We approved fiscal year 2016-17 budget amendment for the local transportation funds pass-through. Approved. A Approved an amendment to the SBCTA Public Transportation Modernization Improvement and Service Enhancement Account Program Expenditure Plan, although we did not talk about driverless cars. Under discussion, we looked at uh, project delivery. There's a nice project on the 395 that is widening that road through Adelanto. So we approved hearings. Uh, we, we held hearings and we approved resolutions of necessity for the parcels that are, will be needed for this particular widening in Atlanta and Victorville. We established an existing planting maintenance project and awarded a contract to Diverscape for the planting on Interstate 10 at the Tippecanoe Avenue interchange. We also looked at air quality traveler service projects and approved a sole source agreement for multi-class heavy-duty zero-emission truck development, a project that they have been looking at for intermodal and warehouse facilities. We approved an agreement with the High Desert Corridor Joint Powers Authority for the exchange of California 381 earmarked funds in the amount of $719,921 for an equal amount of Victor Valley Measure I major local highway program funds. So we did some trading of money on paper. Under administrative matters, we received a presentation of fiscal year 2017-2018 proposed budget. And that was all for that meeting. On May 5th, I was able to take a take part in a four-hour tour of the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District facilities. We began in San Bernardino and the the four-hour tour included the Devil Can Devil's Canyon Hydroelectric Plant which is a state project, which is where state project water comes into our region and it is distributed into the valley to different agencies. One of those is the artificial recharge site for the uh, excuse me, San Bernardino Valley Municipal District. It's right above Cal State San Bernardino. We also visited the Seven Oaks Dam in Highland 
and on, included on the tour was the Citrus Valley Reservoir and Pumping Station in Mentone. Really interesting tour of the actual water facilities that we have in our region that are pretty much hidden from view for most people. But it is a tour that is open to the public. If they are interested, they can go through the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District to sign up for an annual tour of this. They also have an eight-hour tour. I'm also told that if, if anyone is interested in a detailed tour of the Seven Oaks Dam and, and all of its various features, that those can be scheduled through the County of San Bernardino. They give those quite often. So um, the next time that it comes up, I will certainly say something to my colleagues if they are interested. But also what I have is I have a nice little book here called De Delivering the Future. It's 60 Years of Vision and Innovation at the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District. It's their report that spans from 1954 to 2014. It's a beautifully illustrated picture of, or excuse me, uh, has beautifully illustrate, illustrated start over. Beautiful pictures illustrating the history of the water projects in this valley. One of the things that was mentioned on the tour is that most communities and societies develop their water uh, policies when they're coming out of a drought. As you can imagine, when water is uh, plentiful, there isn't too much attention paid to how you need to um, value your resource and save for days when there isn't rain. But because this region has had such experience with drought, this particular agency has done wonderful planning for our region, which helps all of the water agencies, including our own Riverside Highland Water District, or Water Company. They are the ones that are the wholesalers for California State Water Project Water as it comes into the, the valley. And so they do artificial recharge of our basins. So if anyone's interesting, I know to a lot of people, water sounds um, like it's not necessarily very interesting. And we're all happy when we can go to the tap and turn it on and water comes out. But this is a really, really nice way of looking at the history of the water and and the planning that has been done and continues to be done in this region. And I will finish up by also saying that I attended the annual art show put on by the Historical and Cultural Committee. I thank the women of that committee for their efforts, and I applaud the wonderful art that our residents were um, displaying. I imagine we have many more residents who have art they can show, and it can be pictures, it can be drawings, it can be woodworking, there was a woman, a young woman that, that created her own blazer. She created the, she created it from actually coming up with the patterns herself all the way through construction. Very nicely done. There are so many different ways to approach art, and it's wonderful to see the talent that we have in our community. So I will finish there, and we will move on to our next item. Which is unfinished business. Item number seven, zoning code amendment 17-01, an amendment relating to accessory dwelling units. This is a second reading, so we will not have a staff report. Are there any requests to speak on this item? Okay. Then I will bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. I move the adoption of recommendation. One, find that the ordinance exempt from CEQA review pursuant to section 15061B3, Title 14 of the California Code of Regulations. Two, wait for the reading and adopt an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Grand Terrace, California to amend Chapter 18.06 definitions, Chapter 18.63 site and architectural review, and Chapter 18.69 Second family units of Title 18 zoning of relating the Grand Terrace Municipal Code and relating to accessory dwelling units. And may I second that motion? All right, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Council Member Reinars, Council Member Wilson, Council Member Hussey vote yes. Mayor Portem Robles votes yes. Mayor Magdabo votes yes. Thank you. Under new business, we are our first item, item number eight, revision of city council policy for presentation of certificates, commendations, proclamations, plaques, and other recognition awards. May we have a staff report, please. 
Good evening, Mayor, 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 Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, Cynthia Fortune for the City Manager's Office. Um, this staff report uh, supports our vision statement in which Grand Terrace is a place that fosters pride and an engaged community. At its August 9th, 2016 meeting, City Council adopted a policy developed by staff to establish a process to allow members of the City Council to quickly and efficiently recognize individuals, groups, and events of significance to the Grand Terrace community by the issuance of certificates, recognition, acknowledgments, commendation plans, and proclamations. Since then, we have actually um, presented several proclamations, commendations to businesses, um, deserving citizens, and those in our young who have actually reached uh, the rank of ego. Uh, in the Boy Scouts. Part of the policy included that each council member may make the request of staff up to 48 hours prior to the actual event. What we have found is in uh, soliciting all five signatures within that 48 hours was not as um, easy as we thought it could be. So we are requesting uh, a few minor changes to the existing guidelines. Uh, we are proposing instead of a 48, if council can give us a 72-hour 72, 72 notice. That was one. Uh, uh, the second request is that if we could request e-signatures. Uh, sign original signatures will be received from each one. We will make them encrypted and will be dropped into the certificates. If we receive it in enough time, we will either send out an email to all of council, so you can actually see a PDF of the certificate before it is provided to the organization or individual. If we have it enough in time, it will again be on the consent calendar with copies of it so that all of council may review. Um, and then in addition to that, we're also adding uh, just a presentation script for every presentation that we have. We had included it in the guidelines. Um, so what we've done is we've actually uh, provided you a copy of the original guidelines and highlighted all the changes that we are proposing. I, I would like to make one change to the presentation script. On packet page 104 and 105, page 104, letter C, um, it says, after the introduction is complete, Mayor McNabo will read the certificate. Uh, any reference to Mayor McNamara, we're going to change to the mayor because that's what the guideline should say. It's not specific to Mayor McNamara. I apologize for that. Um, Mr. Fortune, may I just also add yes, one question? Maybe the council may, may say the mayor or his or her designee. Yes. The mayor or his or her designee. Uh, that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions City Council may have. Questions of staff at this time? So you're requesting an e-signature. Does that mean we must provide? Yes. We will be um, asking, we will be providing the document we will ask you to sign. And if it was a choice of one of the council members to not give an e-signature, is that acceptable? Yes. And what we will be doing with them is requesting that original each time. Correct. Are there any requests to speak? All right, I'll close public comment and bring it back to council for further discussion or consideration of a motion. Motion for approval for this item, Mayor. Uh, approve the revision of city council policy for presentation of certificates, combinations, proclamations, plaques, and other recognition awards. I'll second that. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Council Member Reinars, Wilson, Hussey, vote yes. Mayor Pro Tem Robles votes yes. Mayor McNabo votes yes. Thank you. Moving on to item nine, which is the continuation of the 24th Amendment to Law Enforcement Services Contract number 94-797 with County of San Bernardino. 
May we have a staff report? Please? Yes, Mayor. Before. Uh, Ms. Fisher provides a staff report. I just wanted to acknowledge and let the council know that the item before them tonight is basically uh, to continue on with the standard service that we've had in the past. This is not uh, going to address any potential increases in service. This is trying to meet the timeline for the County Board of Supervisors to get our Schedule A for them to approve. Any additional request or uh, change in service would be discussed during the budgetary process. Thank you. Mayor, I'm going to to the Council. Before you is a, uh, the 24th Amendment to the Law Enforcement Services Contract. The staff report supports the following goal, goals. Ensuring a fiscal viability through the continuous monitoring of expenditure budgets, allocations and operational costs, and maintaining public safety by ensuring adequate staff levels for police services for our community. Since incorporation, the city has contracted with the County of San Bernardino for law enforcement services. This is our 24th amendment to their contract, and law enforcement duties include the enforcement of state statute, statutes, city ordinances, traffic enforcement, specialized enforcement such as arson, homicide, juvenile and narcotics enforcement, and other related duties. Um, as, as shown in packet page 107, Table 1 provides the uh, detailed level of services that we received from their professional staff. Um, the current year contract, uh, we are expected to end the year with a little over 1.7 million. The contract before you is uh, 1780. So what we're looking at is, is from this year to next year, it was only a 2.2% increase. Um, and this is all that they have provided. As um, Mr. Duffy had mentioned, this will not include any additional services that the City Council may want to consider. Um, should that be something that we propose, then we can go back to the Sheriff's Department and negotiate an additional amendment. As Mr. Duffy had also stated, um, this has to be in front of their Board of Supervisors um, by the first week of June and they uh, would like to see that this was approved by the city prior to them considering the contract. Um, that concludes our uh, presentation. Uh, Lieutenant Wolf from the Sheriff's Department is here, and I am here to answer any questions City Council may have. Thank you. Does Council have any questions of staff at this time? Okay. Seeing none, I'll open up public comment. Is there anyone that would like to speak on this item? Seeing no takers, I will close public comment and bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve the 24th Amendment to Law Enforcement Service Contract Number 94-797 with the County of San Bernardino and authorize the Mayor to execute the agreement and authorize the City Manager to execute the contract. Second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Council members Reinars, Wilson, Hussey, vote yes. Mayor Pro Tem Robles votes yes. Mayor Mactabo votes yes. All right, thank you very much. Moving to item 10 is title is Exclusive Negotiation Agreement with CHP DevCo to purchase and develop housing successor agency property. May we have a staff report, please? Uh, Madam Mayor, <clears throat> if I may, I'm not going to give the staff report, but uh, just an item of uh, procedure. When you opened the meeting this uh, evening, did you open up the uh, successor agency and the, re uh, the housing successor agency meetings also? I did. Thank you. I'm sorry, they're just waiting to get my <clears throat> presentation. Thank you. Great. We're in council, um, shall I say, um, members of the successful housing agency. When the state of California terminated redevelopment, they also, a part of that, there's a law called ABX1. And it allowed a, a city may have liked to retain the housing assets and functions previously performed by the redevelopment agency. And so what the city council did is the city council assumed all the responsibilities of the housing successor agency. 
the City of Grand Terrace City Council designated itself as the housing successor agency to serve as a successor housing agency for the purpose of managing the affordable housing obligations and, and assets for the former redevelopment agency that all housing redevelopment functions. Then, and so what we have here is, this is the land that's actually owned by the housing successor agency. Now because these are assets of the housing successor agency, the city, the housing successor agency can develop affordable housing or the housing successor agency can manage the assets, which includes liquidation. As long as those resources from the sale were port back to the successor housing agency, the city, the successor agency, the housing successor agency, sorry, excuse me, is able to um, liquidate that asset. And so this is the question that we have before the council tonight. So in addition to that, part of where the location of the housing successor agency property is, is in the, within the Barton Road specific plan. And the Barton Road specific plan objectives include maximize the economic position of the Barton Road commercial activities, target businesses that generate sales tax, and, it's, and do commercial clusters uh, and encourage mixed use and encourage consolidation of elongated parcels. And if you look at the parcels I showed earlier, You see how long those parcels are. And so what happens in this particular case, when you put a development in, in the front of these properties, and these, this land becomes unusable, especially if it's a single by, single lot by itself. So I want to just focus in on this. Uh, it's to target businesses that generate sales tax and encourage consolidation of elongated parcels and focus on attracting new commercial uses. So the actions that we're going to be asking the successor agency to take tonight is consistent with the Barton Road specific plan. The proposal, the, the developer is CH Devco, and they, in, they would like to enter into an ENA, exclusive negotiation agreement, for the purchase of the successor agency property for $650,000. They want to have exclusive rights to market the property uh, for 90 days. And then they want to, as part of this, they want to negotiate a disposition and development agreement uh, after the 90-day ENA. So what this really does, it allows CHP DEVCO to attend events like the ICSC uh, conference in Las Vegas this month, which is the largest uh, international retail sh uh, commercial development uh, uh, expo uh, actually in the world, supposedly, in Las Vegas. And uh, they'll be able to market Grand Terrace, uh, our Grand Terrace properties to um, potential developers. It's a place where all of the retailers will be uh, from uh, family apparel to fast food casual to all the major brands that are out there. This is a conceptual design uh, of what they're looking for. Um, so they look at a, a major tenant on the, on back here in this end, some pads for fast food casual, and then another developer in here. And one of the things, that, this is just a, a proposal they sent as part of the development package. But what they'll be doing is they'll be taking this concept to the Las Vegas show and they'll be getting um, some feedback and based on the uh, the number of develop or number of retailers, they'll then maybe reconfigure this this spot. But they are targeting specific types of, of users. Interesting enough, a part one of the partners for the CHP Devco was also actively involved in our Grand Terrace McDonald's, and it's just a, a, a a view of, of one of the properties, which is our McDonald's and then Smart and Final. But within the proposal, they have identified. Uh, home improvement, fitness, sporting goods, banks, uh, crafts, fabric stores, uh, vitamin stores, specialty groceries, pet stores, full service, casual, fast casual restaurants, and gourmet coffee shops. So they're looking at the, the wide range of gamut. But in the DDA, it is actually spelled out for them to target fast food, casual, specialty markets, and family apparel. 
And what this is based on, it's based on their review of our retail sales leakage. And so sometimes people think of Grand Terrace as just that great little small community with 13,000 population and um, total rooftops of a small number. But there's something called the greater urban area of Grand Terrace, or the metropolitan urban area of Grand Terrace. And it's a three mile and a five mile radius. The five mile radius is about $1.44 billion worth of retail demand. And because we're located in the, we call the center of the Illinois Empire, with one foot touching uh, Riverside County and the other foot touching San Marino County, and, and with great access to the freeway, that puts Grand Terrace in a really particular location. And what most people don't realize, too, is that Grand Terrace has the, one of the highest average incomes in the East Valley area of, of San Bernardino County. So um, with that said, CSP DEFCO understands that, and they'll be able to market uh, Grand Terrace in a way. And the most important thing about selection of CHP DEVCO uh, through the conversations is that they're going to bring to us uh, what we believe fits the community of Grand Terrace and meets our retail sales leakage gap. And so they will go out, they will market, they'll bring material, they'll bring material back in for us to look at and, and, and retailers. If the council decides that that's not what they're looking for, then the city won't proceed further in, in, in the process. But really, the, develop, the developers and the retailers are looking, obviously, to make money. We're able to show that based upon our retail sales leakage and based upon the, the average household income, that Grand Terrace in the metropolitan region area, that five mile radius, really is going to be a great location for people to do immediate local shopping. And I must always, as I always end with these reports, I must say this, is that a true testimony to the, sh the buying power in Grand Terrace is that out of the Stater Brothers 52 stock of stores, the Grand Terrace store and the Grand Terrace Stater Brothers always ranks in the top 10% of total sales. The Miguel's restaurant uh, in that same complex is, is the number two in terms of sales volume. The Walgreens and the CVS, they, they do very well. So in between the I-215 freeway and Mount Vernon, there's 27,000 cars per day that exit the I-215 Barton Road. There's 28,000 cars per day at the um, Barton Road, uh, Mount Vernon intersection. So that's a nice volume that's occurring. And Sandbag projects by the year 2030, there'll be 40,000 cars per day actually going down Barton Road. And that's why we're having the $92.3 million interchange project to, to expand that particular area. So with that, uh, Mayor and Council, I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. Are there any questions of staff at this time? Seeing none, I'll open public comment. Is there anybody here tonight who would like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing no takers, I will close public comment and bring it back to council for consideration of a motion. Make a motion to approve the ENA for APN numbers 1167-2301. Two three one zero one and one one six seven three one one zero one with CHP DEFCO and direct development of a de deposition and development agreement for the development of parcels into a commercial development project. Second. All right, please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Council members Reinars, Wilson, Halsey vote yes. Mayor Porto Robles votes yes. Mayor McNamara votes yes. Thank you. So item 11 is the companion item to this one, which is approve exclusive negotiating agreement with CHP DevCo to purchase and develop city-owned property. Okay, we have a staff report, please. Yes, Mayor. And actually, as the Mayor indicated, it's a companion, so I can actually condense this report and we can move forward. Um, 
So this is actually the property, the, the former Joe Stringfield property here, which is a standalone property uh, from the other two housing successor agency properties. So the council purchased this property uh, back in September 19, uh, 19, 2016. So they purchased the property for $820,000 and then moved the property for an additional $74,000. Um, so there it is. Once again, there's a property. Uh, it's, it's consistent with the Barton Road specific plan, particularly, and I want to really focus in on the elongated parcels. Um, the value of the Joe Stringfield property uh, on its own actually has no commercial value. It would have been a, a property for residential for about $350,000, that's what our picture said. But because we, if we combine the properties together, we actually are able to get a value of about $916,992 is what we're going to be selling it to CHP Demco for. The same terms and conditions apply versus what we had in the other report is they will have exclusive right to negotiate uh, to market the property for 90 days. They will do a disposition and development agreement. Uh, and if um, we're not successful in terms of achieving the, their goals, we would not move forward with the, with the ENA for this for, the, uh, for this specific development agreement for this particular property. So uh, this is the companion, as the mayor said. So the overall value for both properties is about $1.5 million that CHP DEVCO would be uh, moving forward in terms of uh, pushing that development for the city. Once again, here is the property. This. Uh, Overlay overlays both the Stringfield property and also the su successor housing agency property. S same material. All right. Any questions for city manager on this item? All right. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to speak on this item? All right. Seeing no takers, close public comment, and I'll come back to council for consideration of a motion. I'll make the motion on this one to approve ENA for APN number 11672302 with CHP DevCo for the development of a commercial retail project and direct staff to develop a disposition and development agreement. Second. Please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Council members Reiners, Wilson, Hussey vote yes. Mayor Pro Tem Robles votes yes. Mayor Macnabo votes yes. Thank you. We'll move to City Manager Communications. Mr. City Manager, do you have some items for us? I do, Mayor. That's some very exciting news tonight. Um, this is an update of the new park and recreation facility progress. So this slide has been online, and as you look, each section indicates that we have the community input, we're at design, contract negotiations, grants submitted, uh, out for bid, construction, and opening. And if you've seen this on online, uh, until today, the little dog just jumped over today to the projects out to bid now. Very excited. We're getting very close to that. Uh, and so we'll keep you posted, and we believe that we'll be back at the council on 613th to be able to award uh, the contract for construction of the dog park. Also, we have our street maintenance project, which the, which the council approved recently. Um, we, we're updating this where residents can actually go in and look at when their street is going to be paved. But now that we have the cost, if you remember the last report, it indicated the cost was going to be spent for each particular street with the cost. So now a resident can get in and find out what's the cost to repair my street, to get my street in a really good, uh, a good condition. So and it's, the data is going to be there for all the, for all 83 streets that are going to have some kind of work done to them to bring them up to a really good PCI payment condition uh, index standard. And so that's online now. Residents can get in, they can find out what it costs. And so some streets are in great condition. It's going to be little cost, and some streets are need more work in this slowly seal process. So that's online, and that's ready to go. Also, just a reminder, I think Councilman uh, 
Uh, Hussey mentioned this earlier. We have the Rabies Vaccination Clinic at Grand Terrace City Hall on Thursday, May 18th, 2017. The S-Dogs are allowed to attend, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. Um, Twenty dollars for rabies vaccination, twenty-five dollars for the avid microchipping. And that's a really great deal that we've been able to provide uh, for for residents. Mr. Duffy, on that one, will residents be able to renew dog license or get a dog license at that event? Yes, they will be. And very shortly, we are, we are working feverishly to get that registration online. So we anticipate within the next uh, three weeks at the latest. The residents will be able to get online and renew their dog license, and we'll send out a notice when that when that occurs. Thank you. Also, the Grand Terrace Active Transportation Plan. It's now time for uh, the, the, our consultants that we hired to go out and and and, and have do events and to get input on the, the city's active transportation plan. This is a part of an award which the, the council received, I believe, of a four hundred thousand dollar grant. $295,000. Yeah, I, I was round up. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so those flyers are going out, and they'll be at the Community Day event and to also uh, get input. It's also a survey that we're, it's going to be online that we're asking residents to be able to take as part of the process. With that, that's the end of my comments. Okay. Madam Mayor, if I, if I may add regarding the active transportation plan, um, the consultant has begun outreaching to the stakeholders to get their participation and input. And so, in the very near future, you'll be the council themselves will be re re receiving some calls from uh, Catherine Padilla. Uh, she's the uh, outreach coordinator for the project. So, I just wanted to alert the council to that. Thank you. Thank you, Director Molina. So, our next item is we have a closed session tonight. So we will be recessing the closed session to discuss three different items. The first one is conference with real property negotiators pursuant to government code section 54956.8 for the property, the 22100 block of Barton Road. Successor agency negotiator is G. Harold Duffy, the executive director. Negotiating parties, Barry Foster, HDL. And under negotiation is price in terms of payment. The second item is conference with real property negotiators, also pursuant to government code section 54956.8, 22100 block of Barton Road. Agency negotiator G. Harold Duffy, executive director, and Barry Foster, HDL, price and terms of payment. And lastly, conference with real property, negoti real property negotiators, pursuant also to code section 54956.8, the property is 22400 Barton Road, Suite 200. City Negotiator G. Harold Duffy, City Manager. Negotiating Parties, Family Services Association. Under negotiation, price and terms of payment. We will be recessing into closed session. Those of you who will not be here when we come back, thank you so much for being here tonight. And thank you for being here to, to take part in our celebration of the progress that we're making on our economic development within the city. And at this time, we are in recess.
All right, we'll re reconvene to open session. The council met in closed session on three items, conference with real property negotiators, pursuant to government code section 54956.8 for properties at the 2200, 22100 block of Barton Road and 22400 Barton Road, suite 200. We did not take any action on these items. However, we did give staff direction on each of the three. So at this time, we will adjourn to the next regular city council meeting, which will be held on Tuesday, May 23rd, 2017 at 6 p.m. Agenda item request must be submitted in writing to the city clerk's office no later than 14 calendar days preceding the meeting. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you again to staff for the festivities, and we are adjourned.